Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Nature Conservancy of Canada this evening. My name is Leslie Nielsen and I'm really pleased to be your host for tonight's Heart of Gold Nature Talks as we learn about the grasslands of BC's southern interior. I'm speaking to you this evening from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people on the ancestral homeland of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, also known as Victoria. Over the next hour, we will be taken on a journey to lands that are steeped in rich history and are home to many Indigenous peoples today. As we share this presentation from many different places, I invite you to take a moment to reflect on the place from which you join us and on our collective responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. I hope you are as excited as I am to spend some time tonight exploring the grasslands of BC's Southern Interior. I know there are many curious folks out in the audience, as some of you have already sent in some advanced questions, and thank you for that. Uh, for everyone else, at any time during the presentation, you can send a question through the Zoom chat function. Your questions won't pop up on screen, but they'll come to us to hold on to until the question and answer period. So don't be shy. We'll take up as many as we can before our time together runs out. Now, on to our journey into BC's Heart of Gold. I'd like to kick things off with a quick poll. Let's find out how many of us here tonight have spent some time in BC's grasslands before. And while the answers come in, I am pleased to introduce our guide for the evening. Barb Price is someone I've had the great honor of working alongside for the past 14 years. In fact, she's the reason that I, someone most at home in coastal forests, have come to truly see and truly love the beauty and immense ecological importance of the grasslands. Barb joined the Nature Conservancy of Canada in 2003 to help ex explore how the organization could contribute to conservation in the Okanagan area. Her passion and leadership for this work has led the Nature Conservancy of Canada to become a thriving, collaborative and impactful conservation partner throughout the Southern Interior. Now, Barb's the first one to say that she doesn't do this work alone, but that won't stop me from acknowledging that Barb has been an inspirational leader and change maker for grassland conservation in BC. We're very lucky to have her with us tonight. And so without further ado, let's bring Barb into this conversation by having a look at the results of our poll. What do you think, Barb? Ooh, this is exciting. Um, it looks like uh, the majority of uh, the people joining us tonight have spent time in the grasslands. So that is fantastic. And uh, so hopefully this will resonate with, with you. And for those who haven't had the wonderful opportunity to spend time in the grasslands, uh, maybe you'll learn a little bit and, and be encouraged to get, get out there at some point. Fantastic. So Barb, why don't you bring up your presentation and, and take us on a journey. I will. All right. Thank you so much, Leslie, for those warm remarks.
All right. Well, here we go. Thank you again. And uh, for the, those nice things you said about me, Leslie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, I want to uh, start by saying, um, you know, when most people think about grasslands, they think about the prairies, um, Canada's great uh, prairie provinces. And in fact, there are grasslands in BC's interior, and they're like nowhere else in Canada. So BC's interior is characterized by grasslands in the valley bottoms, and uh, generally these give rise to dry ponderosa pine forests. And then as you move up in elevation, you know, more moisture comes in, and then these forests change to Douglas fir forests. Sometimes uh, we see western larch in certain parts of the interior, and then rising further up in elevation, lodgepole pine and spruce and into the subalpine fir zone. And the grasslands here formed in the rain shadow of the coast mountains, and typically they're characterized by hot, dry summers and somewhat milder winters. Well, in this arid landscape, these grasslands are dotted with wetlands and where there's enough moisture, we will see deciduous forests of aspen and cottonwood and they provide even more rich habitat across the landscape. And of course, the beauty of these interior grasslands is subtle. Um, it takes a special eye to really appreciate how unique and incredibly diverse they are. This is my mom. <laughs> we all have a story about how we learn to connect with nature. And uh, my love of nature comes from my mom. I grew up in the Caribou region, and uh, our family spent a lot of time uh, in nature. We would go camping on weekends or out for a Sunday drive, and we were often in the grasslands and ranch lands of that part of British Columbia. We knew a fair number of ranching families there as well, and um, given that my mom and dad both came from Manitoba, we would drive across the prairies uh, every summer to go visit family there. And so grasslands were just a common sight for me. They were just part of that landscape. And I honestly didn't really think too much about it, other than they felt like my home too. And it was only when I started my conservation work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada did I begin to really understand how precious and how threatened these grassland ecosystems were? Well, grasslands are important. There are places, places in my grassland landscape where you can just stand there and look in all directions and all you can see are grasslands. It looks like they go on forever, but looks can be deceiving. They're very restricted in British Columbia, and they cover less than 1% of our land base, and yet they provide habitat for over 30% of BC's rare and endangered species. The grasslands are un under intense threat as well. They are easily accessible. They're generally at lower elevations, so they're easy to get to. They don't really have uh, much cover, of course, and so they're easier to develop with the lack of forest. And they host stunning viewscapes. So of course, people want to live here too. So just think about that for a second. Such a tiny part of our province, less than 1% of our land mass, provides habitat for almost 30% of the listed species here. That's pretty impressive. Very early on, it was clear that we had to work in the grasslands and focus on conserving grasslands in BC. And that's how our work in BC, in the heart of gold, was born. 
So when I started with the Nature Conservancy of Canada nearly 20 years ago now, uh, in the South Okanagan Similkameen, NCC hadn't done very much in the area. There was no formal program or strategy for how NCC could contribute to grassland conservation in the province. And I was really excited to take a lead role in steering the growth of NCC's work in the Southern Interior. But like all of our work, it started first with planning. Uh, we undertook a, an eco, uh, the Okanagan Ecoregional Assessment, that's a mouthful, um, to indicate where we should focus our work on the ground. Um, at that time, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, at least here, wasn't super well known in the South Okanagan, but those that did know of us and had heard of our work were very welcoming and they wanted NC to, NCC to engage here. Many groups and individuals had been working collaboratively in, in the South Okanagan Similkameen uh, for decades. Um, and they were working to educate people about the environment, to support scientific studies, complete species inventories, um, secure conservation lands, and maintain communications amongst them, themselves. And I honestly didn't know if there was room for the Nature Conservancy of Canada to do more here, but I'm happy to say that that concern was proven very wrong. So these are our natural areas in, uh, in the interior. And uh, the South Okanagan had long been recognized as an incredibly important area for conservation. The grasslands here are actually one of Canada's four most endangered ecosystems. They hold incredibly high biodiversity values. Oops. Um, and they're under intense threat from development and conversion to agriculture, for example. So 20 years ago, there was a sense of urgency to conserve and protect these unique ecosystems. And that urgency remains today. Many species here are found at the northern limit of their range. And so conserving them in the face of climate change is more important than ever. Species on the edge of their habitat are deemed to be better suited to adapt as the climate changes just because they're used to wider variations in the climate. And land trusts like the Nature Conservancy of Canada focus primarily on private land conservation. So we work directly with private landowners to come up with solutions for conserving their land. This, this approach offers an important complement to conservation that happens on provincial lands through parks and other governmental protected area mechanisms. As a bit of an aside, I can tell you that in more recent years, the Nature Conservancy of Canada has been finding ways to collaborate with the province and Indigenous partners on Crown land conservation. But that's a story for another day. Well, I can tell you that ranchers own a lot of grasslands in British Columbia. <laughs> we understood early on that we needed to work with ranchers in order to, to do any conservation of grasslands that were in private ownership. Most of the ranchers that uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with have been on the land for generations and they didn't want to see the land developed or broken up either. Uh, generally, uh, ranchers have a land stewardship ethic and a value system that's very compatible with our goals for conservation. They know the lands that they've been on for so long, and they have an understanding of how valuable these grasslands are, not just for cattle grazing, but for other species, including humans as well. And each project is about building relationships with these ranchers. Uh, this is one of, our, uh, one of our good folks that we worked with a few years ago here in the South Okanagan. 
in many cases, what we're seeing is that the next generation of ranchers aren't uh, taking on the ranch. And so sometimes NCC can find an opportunity to, to work with them to protect the land. So NCC's first uh, grassland conservation project uh, collaborating with ranchers was in the Canadian Rockies and it was noticed elsewhere in British Columbia. This is a picture of the uh, extended frolic family with a few of us from the Nature Conservancy of Canada a few years ago. So Ray Frolic, right here, um, had done his homework. He had been talking to uh, his fellow ranchers in the Rockies and finding out from them what was it like to work with NCC. I guess he liked what he heard because Ray reached out to us to see if we could find a conservation solution for part of their ranch while at the same time um, infusing some cash back into their, um, their ranching operation. It was, it was kind of cute. We were up at, uh, in Kamloops, a colleague of mine and I, um, doing expert uh, workshops into one of our conservation plans. And at the end of the workshop, we asked them to list some of the, the ranches in the area. And so they gave us that list and I was dutifully taking notes and um, they came to the end of, of their list and they had not mentioned Frolic Cattle Company. And I was a bit concerned about that um, because we had been talking to them for probably six or eight months uh, already at that point. And then one of the people said, well, and then there's Frolic Cattle Company, but they won't talk to you. So I didn't uh, look at my colleague because I didn't want to give away the fact that we were actually in conversation with them about uh, the project we wound up doing with them. Uh, so this is Lac du Bois uh, near Kamloops, and um, this is part of the Frolic Ranch project that we did. It took us about two years of negotiations at uh, the kitchen table out on the land uh, with two generations of the Frolic family. And so at the end of that time, we wound up purchasing uh, 950 hectares at Lac du Bois, and we placed uh, restrictive conservation covenants on about 2,200 hectares of the Frolic Ranch in the Nicola Valley. So speaking of the Nicola Valley, uh, south of Kamloops here, um, this area and this valley had always been of keen interest to us at NCC. We actually knew all the big ranches in the valley, and we were really eager to add to our conservation portfolio there. Having Frolic Cattle Company behind us was absolutely huge, and we were hopeful that new opportunities were on the horizon for us. The Frolic Cattle Company project really put us on the map in the Thompson Nicola, and so. Uh, NCC became the go-to organization for ranchers in this landscape wanting to conserve their lands. So while the ranching community is spread all over BC, it is a small community and word of mouth travels fast. So our work with Pine Butte Ranch and the Kootenays led to the Frolic Project in the Thompson Nicola, and that led to the Warner Phillip Conservation Area, and then that in turn uh, led us to Napier Lake Ranch conservation area. And of course, we're continuing our work in, in the Nicola Valley uh, even today. Well, I'm gonna break things up a little bit. Um, let's, let's do another poll. Um, that should pop up on your screen here in a second. And so what we're gonna do is test your knowledge of some of the species that occur in BC's grasslands. So go ahead and make your selection or select selections and we'll check in 
Oops, did I just turn everything off here? <laughs> I'm just going to check and make sure that that is uh, working. <laughs> okay, it seems that I'm back. I am obviously uh, technically challenged here. Okay, did you guys get your uh, your choices in? All right, here we go. Grassland species. Let's take a look. Um, Sharp-tailed grouse, black bear. Yeah. Good job, everybody. Um, if you selected all of the above, then you're right. Uh, all of these species occur on the grasslands uh, in BC and in the Nicola Valley in particular. Uh, so this is a male, sharp-tailed grouse. And um, he's actually um, on what's called a lek, that's the mating grounds, and the males do their mating dance uh, every year in this very um, special spot in the grasslands. Um, and then we've got Lewis's woodpecker, uh, which is a threatened species in Canada, and they nest in tree cavities, and they will create their own, but they're opportunistic as well. And they will use abandoned holes or natural openings in both living and dead um, trees. And then, of course, it's always a thrill to see black bears uh, on the landscape. And um, we find that they're, they're generalists. They use a broad range of habitats, including grasslands. And then this little beauty, uh, a mountain bluebird. This is a male, and um, they can be differentiated from Western bluebirds that have a rusty brown patch on their breast and um, and their slide and their sides. So my colleague Danielle caught me lying down on the job one day <laughs> in the rough fescue grasslands on NCC's conservation area at Lac du Bois. So um, this is a bunch cross ecosystem that we typically find at higher elevations. And I've shown you a lot of photos of expansive grasslands today, but I want you to see what it looked like up close. And I also want to encourage you the next time you find yourself in nature, just go ahead, flop yourself down for a little while or go for a walk and wander around to your heart's content. So let's move back into the um, South Okanagan Similkameen now. Um, as I said before, we had no idea where we would end up when we decided to have an on the ground presence in the, in the interior and try to make a difference in terms of conservation here. The key to our work was building and sustaining relationships and to keep an eye out for opportunities or even to create an opportunity where we could. As a national organization, NCC was able to engage with landowners and work at a larger scale. We knew about this uh, huge chunk of private land uh, along the Canada-US border and how that area had long been a target for the conservation community in the South Okanagan. We actually worked with five different uh, families over nearly 10 years to um, assemble what is now called the Sage and Sparrow Conservation Area. This is part of uh, the Sage and Sparrow Conservation Area and it is a place that is very close to my own heart. Um, this is uh, Dick Cannings and I um, taking a walk through the grasslands there. Uh, this was the first time I took him there after NCC purchased this particular um, piece. 
And I have to tell you, <laughs> I heaved a huge sigh of relief at, at his extremely positive reaction uh, when we arrived there. So this gives you an idea of the wide range of eco ecosystems and diversity that we have uh, on the sage and sparrow conservation area. We've got these uh, vast expanses of grasslands, um, shrub step, uh, sagebrush ecosystems. Um, we have wetlands and riparian areas along with um, beautiful aspen um, uh, forest, aspen groves, and then right up into the dry interior Douglas fir that I talked about a little bit earlier. So along with this incredible mosaic of ecosystems comes a vast array of species. And uh, when we first started acquiring land on the sage and sparrow conservation area, it was, it was like Grand Central Station down there, honestly. Um, we made that area available to researchers and scientists who wanted to confirm suspicions of species presence um, and abundance. They hadn't really been allowed to go there uh, prior to the Nature Conservancy of Canada um, owning those properties. So to date, uh, there are over 70 federally and or provincially listed species on the conservation area. So I'm going to talk about a few of them. Uh, and yes, we have turtles uh, <laughs> here in this uh, fairly dry ecosystem. Uh, this is a western painted turtle and it is BC's only freshwater turtle. Uh, so wetlands provide really important habitat in an otherwise arid landscape. We also have species like tiger salamanders and spadefoots um, who both uh, thrive here as well. This is a half moon hair streak. Um, one of the wildlife biologists we worked with, uh, who his name's Orville Dyer, and he actually took this photo at Sage and Sparrow. Um, he wasn't expecting to see this endangered butterfly in the area, but we did find them. And that was a very pleasant surprise, even for a veteran wildlife biologist like Orv. We often collaborate with others to support their conservation work. Uh, we're collaborating right now with the Calgary Zoo um, in their effort to assess the possibility of wild to wild translocation of butterflies from Sage and Sparrow to Waterton Lakes National Park in order to support Alberta's only um, half moon hair streak population. So you see, we care about even the little things like pollinators they all have an important role to play in um, healthy and thriving ecosystems. We've encountered an, an amazing array of mammals at Sage and Sparrow as well. Um, these are some mule deer, but we've also seen moose, black bears, coyotes, bobcats, cougars, skunks, western harvest mouse, great basin pocket mouse, nettles, cottontails, um, marmots, pocket gophers, and even the odd badger wanders through from time to time. So it's really important to have these large connected protected areas just to give them room to roam. This is a sage thrasher, and I challenge any of you to say that fast three times and see if you're if it's not a tongue twister for you. Um, this, uh, this bird is listed as endangered in Canada and Sage and Sparrow is actually one of only two currently known nesting sites in Canada. Um, they need stands of big sagebrush for nesting and foraging. And here's a fun fact for you. Um, they prefer to run on the ground rather than flying. Uh, when they're foraging for insects and other invertebrates. And sometimes they'll eat berries too if, if they happen to be around. 
So there are actually 15 species of bats in British Columbia, and sage and sparrow is home to 12 of them. Um, plus, we have one acoustic record for the canyon bat. And this, this bat is, um, we have a recording of it at Sage and Sparrow. Uh, that was an acoustic recording. And uh, they don't have very big colonies. I think they're, uh, they have about 12 pairs in a colony. And they come out a lot earlier in, in the evening than most other bat species. And they weigh as much as a Hershey's Kiss. So they're tiny. And of course we have snakes. Um, this beauty is a Western rattlesnake. And as you probably guessed, it's much maligned and much feared snake, but honestly, they don't want anything to do with you either. Um, Western rattlesnakes are threatened in Canada and um, they give birth to live young, uh, between two and eight babies, uh, only every three years or so. Some of the other snakes that we've uh, encountered at Sage and Sparrow include the Great Basin Gopher Snake, uh, rubber boas, racers, and we have two species of garter snake there as well. So as, as I've already mentioned, uh, we often partner with other organizations as well. And uh, one of our partners is the Burrowing Owl Conservation Society of British Columbia. So we've welcomed them onto NCC's conservation areas. And we now have three reintroduction sites installed on NCC's lands in the Southern Interior. So burrowing owls are extirpated in British Columbia. And what that means is that they're locally extinct. So this is why the reintroduction program is so very important. Burrowing owls don't really dig their own nests, but they rely on burrows created by other animals such as badgers or marmots or coyotes. You've seen rattlesnakes using these burrows too. So there's a synergy there. And baby burrowing owls have developed uh, an effective defense mechanism if they feel threatened or if there's a predator nearby, um, they make the sound of a rattlesnake. And that puts the fear into anybody's heart. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you a short video of what it's like to hang out with the burrowing owls um, down at the Sage and Sparrow Conservation Area. and she gave us fish wildlife band to the right leg and so then this band is put into uh, a north american database so anywhere these owls are found whether it be in a burrow or parking lot and they can send this number um, back to our banding facilities and then let us know where they found the owls i don't know i love it <laughs> that's great oh, I know. That was a really good day, I have to say. It was a privilege to hold hold that little baby and uh, put him back into his burrow before or after he was uh, banded. So, you know, the role that the Nature Conservancy of Canada plays here, um, just getting the land into protection so that species like the burrowing owl have a place to just be. There are amazing things underway at the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and we continue to evolve and do bigger and better conservation. Um, our work with Indigenous communities and partners is expanding, and we have examples of successful partnerships with Indigenous peoples across BC and Canada. So we're collaborating with them in a few different ways, um, either on stewardship activities or land securement, or just simply and humbly learning from them and seeking to look at the land 
and how to care for it through an Indigenous way of seeing. While we've accomplished so much in the 60 plus years since NCC started, there's so much more to be done and we're dreaming big dreams. I think Leslie mentioned at the beginning uh, that I like to say, no one does this work alone. And that is certainly true. I really want to acknowledge uh, the many colleagues that I've had the pleasure of working with over the past two decades. They've all played a role and a very important part in the conservation that we've been able to achieve in the interior of BC. And I'm very grateful to your contribution for conserving grasslands and so much more in this landscape. So that's it for me, but I understand, Leslie, that there may be some questions for us. Absolutely. And thanks for that wonderful journey through the grasslands, Barb. It's always so great to see them through your eyes. I just, I think everyone will agree it would have been that much better if we had been able to be standing out there on the land with you. So, so one day, one yes. day, hopefully. <laughs> so yeah, let's um, turn to the questions. There was one that came in early on. Um, from uh, someone who was asking if grasslands are the same thing as prairies, they answered no to that opening question because they didn't think about this area as being grasslands. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what would you what would you say to to the, someone who wasn't thinking about uh, the southern interior as grasslands? Right. Per se? That is that is a good question. I'm I'm actually not sure why we don't call them prairies in in BC. Um, they evolved differently for sure, like the prairies in Alberta, Manitoba, or Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba evolved differently. There were bison there, and so there are different ecosystems from those that we have in British Columbia. We didn't have bison on this side of the Rockies, and so the grasslands here evolved um, uh, differently um, than on the prairies. So um, the the grasslands, like the bison would be, have been grazing the grasslands and keeping that open state. Is that, are the the um, animals we saw, like the mule deer and other um, grazing animals, are they playing that role in these landscapes? Well, they don't, they don't. Um, um, so if you can just imagine herds of thousands of bisons thundering across the prairies, they churned up the earth as they went. And so that created uh, a new seed bed for, um, you know, to refresh the prairies and regenerate them. Um, that didn't happen with things like mule deer or elk or moose or other ungulates that we have in, in British Columbia. They didn't churn up the soil in that same way. The grasslands here were probably more um changed and modified through fire because we you know what they experienced were um frequent low intensity fires that would roll across the the ground and that would regenerate those systems in that way yeah that's that's super interesting um going in a little bit of a different direction there sure. you mentioned earlier um dick cannings i did and um we do have a question. Who is Dick Canning? Oh and okay. and and also, can you talk a little bit about why um, why it would mean so much for him to be impressed by Sage oh. and Sparrow? Yeah. Well, Dick Canning's is uh, he's a well-known naturalist in British Columbia. He's an amazing birder, and he grew up in in the South Okanagan. Here, his parents were. Uh, naturalists as well and so he's he's actually a very well-known author and I would recommend any of you <laughs> go go sign one of Dick's books out of the library if you can uh, or you know buy them off the bookshelf I've got one right here um, whoops how do I make that how do hold I... it right by your face my face okay <laughs> there you that go works? Yeah, that's it's, good. Uh, this is Birds of the Interior of BC and the Rockies. So uh, anyway, so that's that's who Dick is. Um, 
why it means so much. I guess because of his passion for conservation and his knowledge about the natural world and and these precious ecosystems in BC. And I just have a lot of respect for him and um, as we all do at NCC. And so that's why his opinion about that particular acquisition meant so much to us. That's great. Now, um, do you have a, a favorite property? This is a this oh. is a question coming in. You've worked here a long time. Yeah. What's your favorite? My favorite is the one that I'm standing on in any given day. Um, that's actually like asking you to say which is your favorite child. Um, and my kids know that they're all my favorites. So, um, but the the ones that stand out are, of course, the Sage and Sparrow Conservation Area and uh, Lac Dubois and uh, some of the, the projects that we've done up in the Thompson Nicola. So, yeah, <laughs> talk about putting one. me on the spot, yeah. Leslie. <laughs> well, um, uh, this is coming straight from everyone who's listening, and of course, looking forward to the other uh, the uh, in the other direction to the future. The questions coming in: what uh, what are what are we most interested in? What is NCC most interested in uh, as the next uh, grassland acquisition? Oh gosh, well, you know, there's there's still places out there that need protection. Um, you know, we there's still more private land, both in the South Okanagan Smilkameen, up in the Thompson Nicola. And so, you know, we're always looking for those opportunities to work with um, landowners that have a heart for conservation and and want to see their land protected as well. And when you're when you're looking uh, at the land, when someone, you know, gets in touch and says, hey, mm -hmm. you know, We've got some land here. We've got these lovely grasslands. Do you, do you want to help us conserve it? What What do you look for when you go out? Yeah. Um, well, I usually I, it starts with a phone call or an email. is Is often how how these inquiries come to us, and I will vet the whole thing. You know, right here from my desktop first. I'll take a look at the mapping that we've done for the area. You know, once I know where their where their property lies, and I'll just take a look. You know, using imagery, online imagery, things like that, and the mapping. Uh, what kind of species might be there, um, and then we'll have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And you know, what are what are they interested in? Is it a land donation? Is it are they wanting to sell their land? What you know, what exactly are they looking for? Um, and then if it, you know, every step is, as we progress, the next step is just getting out there and mm -hmm. walking the ground with them and, um, you know, looking at it through their eyes. But we look at things like, are they healthy ecosystems? Have they been cultivated um, or, you know, converted in some way? Um, you know, how natural are they? What kind of species are there? Those are all the things that we take into consideration before um, making a commitment to a conservation project. And um, we have someone asking about um, filling in uh, blocks that are adjacent to current um, NCC conservation areas. Is that a focus of our work? What What would it mean, you know, to have that kind of connectivity? Well, that's a really astute question um because well I like to say bigger is better and connectivity is really important um if we have you know a large chunk like we do at Sage and Sparrow for example um that's better than if we had that same area but if it was dotted you know and separated all over the place and so we're always looking to expanding our holdings you know, where they are currently as well. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. Now, I've got another person asking about um, uh, more the restoration side of things and, and um, uh, they are themselves trying to restore grasslands and some property that they have that's been disturbed. Um, nothing but weeds, they say. We, we, I think we can all uh, 
relate to that in one way or another. Yeah. Um, so their question, what's the best way to germinate bunch grass and, and how, um, how can uh, they prepare the soil to, to be more receptive for planting? So mm -hmm. do you have any comments about that? Well, restoring grasslands is really difficult. You know, once, once they've been um, modified, um, it is difficult to get them back to a natural state for sure. And that's partly to do with the fact that they don't get a lot of moisture. And of course you're battling weeds and we're, we're quite familiar with that. We, we do a lot of that ourselves or invasive plants. Um, there, there is a nurse, I don't know where this person's from, but there's a nursery uh, out of Oliver called Sagebrush Nursery. And they propagate um, a wide variety of, of native species, including blue bunch wheatgrass. I think I think the person asked about blue bunch in particular. Just says bunch grass. Oh, okay. Because we, we've yeah. got many types of bunch grass, but um, if it's blue bunch, they can they can go to the nursery and buy the plugs there from Sagebrush Nursery. And give it a shot, like just try. If you build it, they will come, right? That's that old saying. So, and, and good for you for wanting to do that. <laughs> Sorry, cut absolutely. You off. No, I was just gonna um, just gonna ask a bit about um, the restoration work that uh, you've taken on on any of the lands uh, throughout the southern interior. Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples there of of um, that you could share about, you know, transforming the landscape. Where where are you doing that, and, and yeah. how's it going? Um, well, first off, we try to buy land that doesn't need restoration. Like that's that's the first thing. Um, but of course, sometimes it needs our help. And actually, a, a really one good example here in the South Okanagan is um, a property that we call a Soyuz Oxbows, and it's just north of um, a Soyuz. Did I say a Soyuz oxbows? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's just north of a Soyuz uh, along road 22. We've got properties on either side of that particular road. And we're trying to bring back the um, those valley bottom um, wet meadows and cottonwood, red osier dogwood, willow ecosystem that used to be there. Um, that property was actually a cultivated hayfield, but there's so little of that land left in the South Okanagan that we're trying to restore that one. And so they were actually just out there last week doing some plantings for us along along the riparian area there. So that's that's one example. Fantastic. Um, looking north, we've got someone asking about um, if we have any acquisition activity in the Chilcotin. Oh, um, we we do. Well, we've we have some properties up in the West Chilcotin, uh, specifically in the Tatlioko Valley. And those lands were purchased a number of years ago. Um, gosh, I can't tell you the the area or the size of it or anything like that. But we do have holdings up in the West Chilcotin. Um, and then there's a couple along the Clean a Clean River as well. So yes, we have some up there too. Um, thinking about the next up and coming uh, generation of conservationists, people getting into this work, maybe there's some um, younger folks listening in today um, and wondering if you have any career advice for for students or are really actually I would say anyone of any age who might want to get into um, helping conservation happen in the province right well if there are young people listening tonight that would just be thrilling for me that they're interested in in grasslands in BC um there's there's a lot of different avenues that young people can take nowadays you know there's not just universities but there are technical programs or or um, institutes of technology that offer a wide variety of um, environmental programs or conservation science 
any of any of the sort of what I call the earth sciences, like range management or forestry, even it's not just grassland conservation that we're interested in. Um, there's a lot of programs that they can they can look into and make a career that way. But for young people, I would say look for opportunities to volunteer. Um, in your community, there might be other land trusts or, you know, stewardship groups that are doing work on the ground, and th there may be opportunities there to, to volunteer, and that's a great way um, to learn, too, and to figure out what you love about nature. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think we've got time for one last question. And we, we do have um, someone wondering how they could go visit one of these areas. Oh, um, okay. Well, I'll talk about Sage and Sparrow Conservation Area. Um, you can drive in there. It's a rough, pretty rough dirt road i wouldn't suggest going in on uh you know don't don't take your car in there for example like an suv or a truck or something like that and you can drive to a couple of points um that get you onto where the conservation area is and then from there you can just walk around to your heart's content and i if i'm not mistaken there might be a map on our website about how to get there so, yeah. um, and we do encourage people to get out and walk on the land. You know, we don't want any sort of wheeled vehicles on these very sensitive grasslands because they are really easily um, damaged. And so we just want people to get out and walk and enjoy nature just the way we do. That's fantastic. Yes, and and if uh, if anybody is interested, you can find them. Um find that information on uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada website, natureconservancy.ca. Um, thanks, Barb. Um, that is fantastic. And I hope everyone um, has enjoyed uh, the conversation and the presentation so far. Thank you for sharing your stories and your experiences with us tonight. Okay. Um, Nature really does need champions like you and like everyone who's been following along um, and asking questions. And I know many of you out there who have tuned in have made generous gifts to the Nature Conservancy of Canada because you believe in the value and importance of conservation. So thank you for being part of this work. It really wouldn't be possible without your support. Mm -hmm. Now we're approaching the end of 2022 and the gift giving season is upon us. So if anyone uh, might be considering making a gift for nature through the Nature Conservancy of Canada, I encourage you to consider making your donation on Giving Tuesday. This Global Day of Philanthropy is coming up on November 29th, and we're honoured to have the Collings Stevens Family Foundation on board as our match partner in British Columbia. What this means is that your donation on Giving Tuesday is worth double if you make it on that day. You can learn more, more about it um, at natureconservancy.ca and a heartfelt thank you to the Calling Stevens Family Foundation for leading the way on Giving Tuesday this year. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. I wish you the very best for the rest of your evening. So good night and enjoy nature. <laughs>